Hi, beautiful people. Welcome to the debut episode of In the Gray. I am your host, Brenda Davies. Today we are talking to an incredible person who happens to be one of my favorite porn stars. His name is Aaron Smallhands Thompson. And yes, we figure out whether or not he indeed has small hands. And this episode is also sponsored by BetterHelp because we all deserve to ask for and receive the help that we need. The human experience is not easy. I know so many people have benefited from therapy, and let's be honest, reaching a personal goal of being healthy, mind, body, and soul is no easy feat. The therapist at BetterHelp can empower you to face anxiety, fear, insecurity, depression, relationship woes, trauma, you name it. If you're facing a dilemma, large or small, BetterHelp can help. If you're a bit wary of therapy, BetterHelp is an excellent option because you can customize the experience to you. You can choose between text if you don't want to be seen, phone or video calls, and the therapists are matched to your personal needs. BetterHelp is more affordable than in-person therapy, and you'll be matched with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is all about. And as a special offer to In The Gray listeners, you can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash godisgray. That's betterhelp.com slash godisgray. Thank you again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast episode. Now, let's get into this beautiful conversation with Aaron Smallhands Thompson. And I truly believe this is a great debut episode for In the Gray because the adult industry, the films themselves, the performers, the viewers, all carry a cultural stigma. And therefore, I've really only seen this conversation had from the lens of pro-porn or anti-porn. But again, here on In the Gray, we wanna dive into the mess and complexity and nuance of every subject. So this is just one conversation between myself and a man who is having an excellent time as an adult film star. But this is not the only conversation we will be having about the sex industry because it is so complex. So I hope that you thoroughly enjoy this conversation between myself and Aaron Smallhands Thompson. Aaron's single, Closer, debuted on Valentine's Day and the Empty Streets album, Age of Excess, will drop on February 28th. Please search for and download Aaron's album and please like, subscribe, share with your friends, donate to my Patreon or Venmo if you can. Enjoy the episode. Love you all so much. God bless. Hi, beautiful people. Today we are interviewing Aaron Thompson, also known as Small Hands, one of my very favorite porn stars. Aaron, you are a musician under the name Empty Streets. You've got a new album called Age of Regret. And as I said, you're one of my favorite porn stars. So let's talk about all of it. Wow, what an intro. <laughs> I'm flattered. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Okay, so I wanted to start at the beginning because I reached out to you because I fell in love with you at a very particular moment when I was genuinely researching porn. Okay. I was telling friends, I was like, I'm really horny because I've been researching porn all day, but I really was. I was like scouring, looking for different things because for so long it hasn't resonated with me. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you more about that later. Okay. But, but when I reached out to you... I discovered that you are the product of a pastor, or no, a Baptist minister, and you were pastor, in preacher, minister. It's all the same okay. shit. <laughs> and you were in church six days a week growing up. Sometimes more. So tell me about that. Um, so yeah, uh, I grew up in San Diego, and uh, my my father was a, a preacher, minister, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and my mother was a nurse and she worked the night shift, the graveyard shift at a hospital down there. And so a lot of the times my dad would just take us to, to work, you know, to church. And so, you know, one night it'd be youth group, one night it would be like uh, feeding the homeless, one night it would be a, just skateboarding in the parking lot when my dad wrote a sermon, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I really like lived in church for, you know, my whole childhood uh more or less um and it was when that's the only thing you know um it it 
didn't seem weird at the time. It was just, this is what we do and this is life. Um, so I wouldn't really say it was um, well, I, I, uh, torturous for me or whatever um, until maybe I got into like my teen years and I started to just learn about things and experience more and kind of the veil was pulled back a, a little bit on a lot of what you don't see as a child uh, mm. versus, you know, when you, when you start to learn about things. Um, so that was a, a kind of like childhood in church. Um, my dad also was a, uh, they call it inner city missionaries, meaning you don't go to the jungle and try to save people in the Congo. You go to Compton or you go yeah. to Southeast San Diego, you yeah. go to the hood. So I remember being eight, nine years old and my dad uh, produced his own like teen Christian newsletter, like total propaganda. And he would force me, we'd go to like the, the urban schools, stand outside and I'd try to like hand out Jesus pamphlets to fucking kids who did not want to, like, what are you, you know, I, just getting oh, screamed God. at and spit on. and me like so nervous. And, and, you know, my dad's I mean, Mr. Evangelical. He didn't give a shit. So he's out there just, just preaching the word and I'm just getting dragged along for the ride. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was wild. <laughs> yeah. What kind of messages were you, like, do you remember being told about your body or sexuality, especially like starting young? Did you feel like it was always a no or? Uh, well, what my parents did was they took the route of just ignoring it completely. Okay. Mine too. They, they actually, um, they pulled me out of public school sex ed uh, which I think started in junior high or something. Uh, you know, they didn't want me learning about it. Mm -hmm. I guess they thought maybe if I just never was told anything, I would well, be, totally be a virgin until, <laughs> you know, marriage and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I will, I do remember one time, this was my dad's pathetic attempt at, at this. Um, I think I was like 12 or 13. He said, Oh, you know, you're, you're, you're getting older now. You're kind of becoming a man. We need to like, there's some things I got to, go over with you. And so I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, we're going to go uh, on a little camping trip, father and son. And I was like, all right, so I guess I'm finally going to get this like talk, you know, because obviously at the time my, my friends were starting to kind of know about things. And um, I, you know, I grew up really sheltered um, media wise too. We didn't have cable TV. We didn't even have the internet, I think, until I was in college or something. Um, mm -hmm. I typed all my reports on a typewriter. I mean, we were poor and they morally didn't, they wanted to shield me from the world. So I really was pretty sh like, like in a bubble until like high school. And then I was like, how, how do my friends know all this? You know, like what's going on? And so anyway, my dad takes me out to the, this cabin in the woods. And Where you it, can't run away. It's like I know, it's so creepy. And, and instead though of talking to me, he hands me a bunch of cassette tapes from like some super insane conservative, you know, Billy Graham shit, Christian, whatever. And it's like, like, this is the talk on a tape. And then he just left me alone in this fucking room and told me to listen to the tapes and never talked about it. Ne we never like went over anything and that was it. <laughs> it's like the Christian version of the rain. <laughs> yeah. And like, oh my God, in those tapes, it was telling me like, uh, if you masturbate, you're cheating on your future wife. Like even that is a, you know, just crazy, crazy stuff. And how did it hit you though when you were listening? Like were you, because you are obviously being fully indoctrinated. Mm. You don't have any concept of the outside world, not even being exposed to like mainstream TV. If you're listening to that, is it just like, oh, well, this is true because it's my dad? Um, I mean, what, when I was young, yeah, because that's what you do when you're young. You trust your parents. And, mm -hmm. and when they, uh, the conviction, you know, that he had with all of his things was so uh, unwavering and so strong when you're, when you're little, like, well, fuck, that's, of course, that's what we do. This is what my dad said, you know. Yeah. Um, but as I got older, the, the curtain kind of was getting pulled open and, and the, you know, the, the, I started to kind of just see things, uh, for, for, uh, in a different light. Uh, do you remember a certain moment where things started shifting? Um, yeah. I mean, when I started to like, you know, in my adolescence, I, I was a horny kid <laughs> and I, and I, I was, and I was always like, I felt awful about it. I, I felt like I was going to hell. I felt like, like mm -hmm. I would like fucking 
masturbate and then pray for repentance crying as a 15 year old like what is that you know yeah. and and uh because i not only didn't get good information i got basically no information i got like the cold shoulder from my parents i had to just kind of figure it out i guess but i was like i wasn't sexually active in high school at all i didn't girl i wasn't like a cool guy who got the girls you know i i was I, I was I was not a, a ladies' man by any any means, um, and even when I got in out of high school into college, I had like one girlfriend for a couple of years. You know, it was very nothing too crazy, nothing wild. <laughs> um, and then I started playing in bands, and I started traveling, and that's when I that's when I really started to learn uh, a lot about sex. <laughs> okay, pause for one second though. Do you remember the first time you saw porn? Because I, if I you're do. from that era, you didn't just pop I do. on a porn. Head. And there were two, I remember them so clear. Um, there were two really like pivotal moments yeah. where maybe looking back, I'm like, wow, it's a little foreshadowing. Um, so when I was growing up, uh, there was like an alley behind our apartments. And there was like a biker guy who lived down the street and he would always work on his car or his bike uh, with the garage door open. And the walls were plastered with like penthouse and playboy and all these centerfolds and and i had never really seen like a naked woman before like especially not like that and i remember i was i was probably like eight years old or something eight or nine and i didn't even know what i was looking at but i couldn't stop and i would i would then like make it part of my like daily routine like really slowly like always ride my bike by this garage and just be like wow and he he didn't give a shit you know he, he and then so that was the first time it was like it wasn't even porn it was just the the female naked form and i was just like obsessed and i didn't even know why or what was going on and then the, the other the first time i saw like a porn was um uh since we didn't have cable or internet or anything and we, and we, you know we were not too uh you know we were pretty poor growing up uh i what i w did do is i would rent my, my, my grandpa would tape like Frankenstein and Godzilla and like old, old cheesy movies uh, off, off cable at his house on VHS tapes okay. and like, like, like library style. He'd like, oh, do you want to like rent Frankenstein? I'm like, yeah, cool, monster <laughs> movies. And what I didn't know is sometimes at the end of those VHS tapes, my grandpa was taping some other things off like the Spice Channel and the late night <laughs> stuff. And I remember... And I remember one one night, me and my brother were just watching, you know, King Kong or something, and we both fall asleep. And I and like I, I kind of wake up, and then the tape's still rolling, and all of a sudden, something very different comes on, and and I kind of I I'm I of course I'm just you know glued to the TV, like oh my god, like I don't even again I don't really even know what this is, but but yeah, I'm here for it, and and then it was just a. Uh, uh, a quest, I think, of uh, finding out how to become. That's when I knew I wanted to be like someone girls liked. Oh. Okay. I was like, wow, like, like this is so, you know, it's doing something to me. And then I would, you know, see how like uh, girls would treat like the cool guys, or, or like, you know, like 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 guys who were like desirable and and i sure wasn't when i was young <laughs> and i was like wow so so i want to be like a guy who gets girls like like fuck like okay like that this this is like where i where i want to go <laughs> yeah. um and not in a like a, a like a vindictive or a dark way but like 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 something to aspire to you know yeah can i tell you i remember my first like erotic feeling was my friend's older sister had a cassette tape of Guns N' Roses and I saw Slash in his top hat with his like gorgeous hair cascading and just he was just shirtless and he had like the lead lines yeah. and I just I think I was exactly eight too and it was like I felt like almost nauseous because like I didn't you... know how to process what I was feeling mm -hmm. but I was like Ugh. and I remember I threw the tape in disgust but I went, I made an excuse every day to go to my friend's house. I was like, I left something out of her house. I need to go in your sister's. Mm -hmm. And I was always creeping mm -hmm. back to get that creepy feeling mm -hmm. and then throw the tape. Yeah, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, what's well, it's like a sensation that you've never mm -hmm. experienced before when you're young. And 
a lot of times we don't know what to do with that. <laughs> yeah, and I have the same upbringing as you where I say I lived in a sex silent household. Mm -hmm. So it was just like... It almost didn't exist, like the concept of it, yeah. Yeah, so you definitely no idea what those feelings were that were emerging. Mm -hmm. So now you're like, I want to be this man that women want. And then you start making music around when? Um, I started, I found my mom's like old hippie guitar in the garage when I was, you know, nine or 10 and mm -hmm. thought it was cool. And so I bought a book of chords and just started messing around. But I started playing music like in bands and real shit when I was like 15, 16. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, and your I, dad allowed that? well, because, uh, we would make a band with kids from the church, like a youth group okay. band. But it was we were playing like like punk music and stuff. But as long as you know we weren't cussing and uh -huh. we were rehearsing at church, it, it was okay. So um, uh, my first band was with my little brother and another like high school friend of mine, and we actually would um, we would practice in a, a. My friend lived in a trailer park on the high school campus because his dad was the janitor. And so after school hours, there's, it's a huge place. No one's there. You can make noise. So wow. we would like have all of our rehearsals in his trailer, like park, trailer home, uh, in the living room on the school campus. Just terrible. So loud. Like, so yeah. Because because his my my the other guy in, in the band, his parents like loved it. Thought we were so. Oh, you guys are going to be rock stars. And they were so supportive. It was cool because my parents were not supportive. Kind of like sex. They didn't stop me from playing music but they just didn't want it around them they just mm. kind of with most things just just uh get it don't don't bother us with it don't have it interfere with you know anything that they deemed important um yeah. so they they never supported it um but it's not like they didn't allow me to uh, they just kind of rolled their eyes and was like whatever you know <laughs> mm -hmm. But then it did lead you down this devilish pathway where then you started engaging in more sexuality. Yeah. Obviously, I'm being facetious. Well, I mean, I, no, I mean, I, I never, um, you know, I never had casual sex uh, uh, or multiple sex partners or anything until I was in my 20s. Um, you know, uh, I think by the time I was 22, I'd still had sex with like two people. Mm -hmm. um, and they were both, you know, serious girlfriend, very monogamous classic relationships. Did you feel any shame in those situations with your upbringing? Um, no, because by then I had already, I was already mentally like checking out and like, I, I kind of, by the time I was about 16, I knew that like, this is garbage. Like this oh. is bullshit. Like I just, the hypocrisy and the betrayal and the, the, I, I would, the, I would see and hear one thing and then I would, watch the actions and it's just I'm like this is awful and the way inside I was always feeling conflicted and like am I a terrible person because I'm always like aroused or because I like you know sexual things yeah. uh, you know and and I just it's got it, it is and and it got to the point where I finally was like you know what I think and this is crazy but I think this is all bullshit like I, I I'm I, I just don't accept it anymore you got out so much sooner than me and well, and, and once I kind of had that mentality, I was like, all right, well, then as soon as I turn 18, you know, and, and again, no, like I never was a person who was like, fuck God or fuck you. I just nice, nice seeing you. Good. But wish you well. I got to go do my thing now, you know, yeah. and I got the fuck out of there and and I never looked back and, and I don't regret it at all. Um, if anything, uh, I, I'm happy that I. I sort of had a, a realization um, because uh, it's, it's a, it was kind of a prison in, a, in some ways. And, and um, also it mentally, I, I got so much better when I like realized a lot of these, those, the baggage and the things that were kind of uh, wearing me down that came, stemmed from that were, were kind of not real, <laughs> or at least to me, you know? I love how you're saying that because that's what dissonance does. It really torments the spirit, torments the body, everything. And mm -hmm. talking about crying after masturbating, it's mm -hmm. like, yes, that is wrong. Masturbating isn't wrong. The crying and the torment. Right. Is wrong. But when you're prepped or geared mentally where, to where that's, you know, I'm like, well, this is what my parents say is wrong. And I just did it. Fuck, you know, <laughs> please. <laughs> I don't want to go to hell. And, you know, and when you're a child and the threat of like the concept of hell is so 
terrifying. It's abusive. And, and it's yeah. like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> what a t propaganda tool to use on a child. Um, yeah. I just love the irony of like parents trying so hard to confine you and then this is the person. Well, that was when it got fun. Oh, because, <laughs> well, one, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to say this. That doesn't sound a little disrespectful, but once I realized that my parents were wrong and I was smarter than them, <laughs> I was like, oh, I can, I can, this is so hilarious now. Like I can do this, I can do anything I want. And you know, and not only will they not know, cause that's what they want. They want to be kept in the dark easy. I'll keep you guys in the dark and go live my life. But like, there's not even a, a, a debate because I, I, I grew up with so much knowledge of the church and scriptures and like you, no one could argue with me when I would talk to them because we would start to have a discussion maybe about, you know, thinking things differently or whatever. And I would win all the arguments, uh, even with my parents. So it got to be the point where I'm, it only solidified me in, in, I'm like, this is, this is correct. I'm, I'm doing the right yeah. thing. Um, yeah. Okay. So then you, that's brilliant. You go out of this world and then you're touring, you're with bands. Mm -hmm. And then you started having casual sex? Or? Yeah, so I was, <laughs> I remember uh, I was on one of my first tours and it was, we played a concert and it was the first time two girls ever wanted at the same time to like yeah. have sex with me. And I was like, whoa, like <laughs> this is like some stuff that only happens in movies. You know, like I just, I, I never, nothing even close to that had ever happened. And, and um, I remember, uh, I was like, I'm single, like, fuck, like, what other, what other time is this gonna, you know, and again, when, when it's happening, I'm like, this will never happen again. This is like, <laughs> this is the only threesome. Wow, I'm gonna get to have a threesome. And, um, <laughs> and, and it was cool, because it was, it was really fun, and the, the girls were older, and they kind of like, mm. they knew I was kind of a fresh-faced and naive, and they, they kind of showed me the ropes, and, and, you know, I woke up alone and they had a little note and it said like, that was fun, wink, wink. And I was like, wow, there's, there's a lot of, I need to, there's a lot of the world out here I need to explore. Yeah. And then- and you didn't feel taken advantage of or anything? No, I, yeah, it, yeah. it was great. It was <laughs> I yeah. felt on top of the world. Um, <laughs> Wonderful, that's how it should be. And then from there, I just, I also realized that I really, maybe, could, you know, doing music and everything, I, I, I really enjoy engaging with people. Um, and to me, sex is just another way to engage. And if anything, it's a very cool, like elevated way to engage with someone. Um, but I don't view it too differently than like just having a conversation that that's intimate and in depth or, you know, just hanging out with someone that you really enjoy. Like that's still a, an experience that two people are sharing. Um, and since I, you know, my, from my youth being a sort of awkward, Tourette ridden, uh, you know, twitchy little kid with thick glasses and headgear and, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, I always wanted to, to, to not be that, you know, I, I wanted to, to aspire to be something else. And I also realized socially that um, I wasn't going to make it in this world if that's all I was, you know. Um, so I had to sort of transform and rise to the occasion. And then once I did that and started having... Uh, some casual sex and, and more just sort of loose op open sexual encounters. I, I just loved the experience of it where it, it wasn't like I wanted a bunch of notches on my belt. I just was like, I want to meet someone else and have another experience with them. And then I want to like, wow, like, look, like, what's your deal? Like, like, let's da da da. And it wasn't even that I was like, like fucking every night on the road or anything. I, you know, for, for a band guy, I was still pretty, <laughs> pretty, uh, you know, not too wild, but it was the first time maybe, you know, in like a month I'd been in like a different city every night and maybe one out of every four or five of those nights I had sex with someone and then, and they weren't my girlfriend, you know, and it was like, and then the next time I'd come in the city, I'd see him again. I was like, wow, this is cool. I have all these like gorgeous friends that I get to kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah, but, but not at, at least what well, I mean, I, the, you know, the, the, that was a good song. <laughs> um, no, I like, I just like how you're describing like the intentionality behind it. Cause I think there's a cliche that 
And a lot of men do do this. They'll like use their power or their fame to take advantage of people. But thinking of sex as like this communicative reciprocal conversation between your bodies and between another person, I think it's a beautiful way to have casual sex. Well, and it makes it then um, equal. Like yeah. there, there's not a, a power dynamic necessarily, or it's just two people who want to like share some chemistry and no one should be shamed on either end for that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's also when I realized that like it's okay to have sex for sex sake and I'm not going to be ashamed of it. I'm not going to, I'm also not going to hide it. You know, some, I would meet uh, girls along the way who that wasn't okay. And I'd always, or as much as I, in my mind, I could uh, be like, Hey, well, well, you know, I, if you want to have sex, that's totally awesome. Would love to, but you, I'm not, we're not going to date. Like, it's just not what we're doing. Um, and I would meet people who were totally fine with that. I would meet people who weren't and you, and you, I would try to be, uh, respectful and responsive to to every individual because you can't just expect every human on this planet to be wired sexually the same as you yeah. and so it was one of those things where I, I was like well there's so many people in this world all I have to do is kind of like meet the ones who are like me and yeah. then it's awesome and you know that's kind of like that was the mentality um, that I always had with with like casual sex especially um like in the band, the band era, I call it, when I was touring a lot and traveling. Because <laughs> yeah. um, that's very different than, you know, the adult industry and, and porn sex, which is its whole own thing. Um, Great yeah. segue. Speaking of e equality, mm -hmm. um, you are married to the wonder wonderful Joanna. I Kim am. Now. I am. Going on 10 years. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. And um, she, I know, is a pioneer of the alt porn gender, mm -hmm. not not gender, genre, <laughs> not to be confused with the alt right in any way, shape, or form. How do you describe alt porn so for people who don't know? Um, I mean, when it, I don't even think that term exists anymore. I mean, what is alt? <laughs> but at the time, yeah, you know, but... when when Burning Angel first started, um, it was. The, the performers who had a heavily tattooed, pierced, colored hair, um, just, you know, um, alternative style, I guess, you know, <laughs> yeah. it stems from alternative rock, probably like those corny terms. Um, well, porn loves its categories. Yeah, so. you, you got to get in, fit into some, you yeah. know, category. So I, I guess alt porn, uh, the easiest way is anything that wasn't like blonde, beach, Barbie, you know, look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Joanna was the first tattooed model on the cover of Hustler. Yeah, and yeah. they tried to uh, they tried to airbrush her tattoos out, and she had to <laughs> she had to walk into Larry Flint's office and sit on his lap and say, "Larry, you're not going to do that. You're not going to take those off." Wow, well, that's iconic. Okay. And she she basically said that if you're going to take my tattoos out, then don't put me on the cover, and they kept them. So wow, what a queen. Go Joanna. Wow. <laughs> 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 That's amazing. Yeah. So when I know your origin story mostly, mm -hmm. um, but do you remember like the moment you met and what you thought when you saw her? Uh, my first thought was, wow, you are so much She's tiny. teenier than, than, <laughs> than you appear on camera. Um, well, our, our meeting was bizarre because we basically, so I, I owned a company in San Diego um, where I was living at the time and we made uh, merchandise for bands, uh, apparel for bars and restaurants. It was a printing company. Mm -hmm. And so I met Joanna because initially she was my client. I, she, I made t-shirts that said like blowjob and anal and I would ship them <laughs> off. And we all were fans because we all knew who Burning Angel was. So me and the guys in the, the shop, we had like a poster of her on the wall. We're like, oh, it's so cool. We make, okay. we make shirts for Burning Angel. Mm -hmm. and, and then at some point, uh, a mutual friend of ours, uh, like kind of wanted to set us up and so Joanna started flirting with me on like gchat when she would place orders she she she'd ask like dumb questions about t-shirts that were that weren't didn't need to didn't need to be asked and then she'd be like so like what music are you listening to and I'm like oh my god I was like Joanna Angel's like like talking to me talking to me and, and then at some point because she's uh she's much more bold than me she said so dude do you want to like hang out or what and I was like oh my god like yeah, yes I do. <laughs> and uh, I, 
uh, basically almost blew it because the first date she offered me, uh, it was 4th of July. She said, okay, we'll come up to my house in LA because I, um, I lived in San Diego still, um, you know, and we'll hang out in group setting. That way it's, you know, super low key, no pressure. And, but I was like, you know, I was a fan. So I was like, I got nervous and I got a little drunk at brunch in San Diego. And I was like, I can't drive to LA. Uh-huh. So I, I, I basically pussied out. And I, I texted her and I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, I, I stopped by a friend's and I, I, I can't drive. And she was like, whatever, dude, like Aww. so over it. And then the next day I woke up and I was like, dude, I felt, I kicked myself and I was like, like, how did you just blow that? And so I messaged her. I was like, let's give it one more shot. I said, listen, super sorry. That was so idiot of me. What are you doing today? I'll drive up to you. I'll take you to lunch. Like, is there any way we could just hang out at all? And she said, yeah, okay, drive up right now. Take me to lunch. And it took Where'd like, uh, we went to a little British pub, like a block from her apartment in Van Nuys. Um, and we walked there and, uh, other than being tiny, <laughs> uh, that was my first thought. But then we, we ended up just talking about music for like three hours. Mm. Uh, and I, and I, we, that's when I was like, okay, like this it's is, on. this is like, <laughs> this is someone I want to spend more time with. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I already obviously knew like the porn part. I, I, we didn't even talk about porn cause first of all, I thought that would be sort of rude or I don't know. It just didn't seem to be the thing to lead with. Yeah. But also I, I, I kind of always like, well, let me, let me see how much this girl knows about like punk rock and music. You know, I'm like, is she a poser? Like, let me, <laughs> let me see what her deal is. And she was doing the same to me, like sussing me out. And we kind of like, just dorked out on a bunch of like records and our favorite bands and everything and by the end of it I think we were both kind of infatuated with each other because we that was it I mean from the first date we've basically been dating ever since that's amazing that's very sweet I love it and I'm fascinated with you know it shouldn't be so unusual but you come in knowing they're going on a date with a porn star Mm -hmm. all of your friends have seen her Mm -hmm. having sex with other people Do you have any stigmas that are existing in your mind from patriarchy, from culture, from your church, or are you really coming in with like purity? I mean, on the first few dates, I was more just, okay, if we do have sex, I hope I'm good enough for her. You know, like that's, that was really all it was, was like, I hope, I hope I can hang. I hope, you know, like, (laughs) you know. never any ego of like, like ownership over her, her body. Oh, who could own Joanna? Oh my God. <laughs> Good luck trying. <laughs> you know, no, you I, men. You know what I'm talking I, about. I think one thing I guess I will attribute to my father and my upbringing is he wasn't, he wasn't really chauvinistic or misogynistic, or at least uh, in action. I mean, maybe his, who knows? I think Christianity is inherently misogynistic and yeah. chauvinistic, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but I was always raised with the, just the concept of like, no, we're all, we're all equal. There's no, there's no, I'm better or worse. Um, or I, or, or, you know, women are to be conquered. It, it, and again, if anything, I think growing up as such a, a, a twitchy, you know, awkward kid, um, I wanted to not conquer anyone. I wanted to be desired. So it was like, well, I'm going to. I'm going to just work on myself as much as I can and become what I think, you know, someone might want, because to me, that was the ultimate, not, not like grabbing someone and saying, like, because, because I'm bigger than you or stronger than you, you are mine. Like, what is this? I'm not a caveman. And I always thought, wouldn't it be so cool to, to be like wanted by someone? That's the ultimate, not like domination or ownership. True, like, Mm -hmm. like, like, glory or, or power really if you want to think of it in certain terms is is being able to walk in a room and not have to grab someone or not have to do that and just have them come to you and I thought wouldn't that be so incredible if I could possess that amazing that's really beautiful god um you also said this quote that I loved you said I don't become directly aroused by the thought of my wife having sex with other people Mm -hmm. but I am very aroused and excited at the thought of my wife experiencing every adventure every high Mm -hmm. I want her to have it all because I love her cheers that's beautiful and I mean it's just I think people are like 
beginning to like men are starting to embrace their divine femininity mm -hmm. and like sorting themselves out and getting rid of a lot of those toxic messages but i think and i like think it's shifting but there's still a lot of people that are grasping on to monogamy for the sake of monogamy and for being like raised that mm -hmm. way but in that perspective it's just i don't know can you explain that more i guess of just delighting in her having experiences and i'm sure that expands beyond sex as well God, i said it so well in spin <laughs> i'm like wow uh, no one's ever read it back to me before um no it, when you in my opinion uh love someone truly and wholly you want them to to win i call it like mm -hmm. like so that can mean anything that you know you want them to like kill it at their job. If they have some dreams or, or hopes of, or some passion project, you want it to be successful. If they want to go travel to, you know, Germany or Sweden, yeah, hell yeah, like fuck. Like, cause why wouldn't you want the person you love to, 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 to have what they want for lack of a better word. And you're what they want cause they're with you. Mm. But that it's very selfish and short-sighted to think that that's enough. We're all like, complex people who want a, a myriad of things out of life and and it takes a variety of things to make us all whole and, and happy and, and um, a relationship is a piece of that and it's it's a very important piece of it but it's not the whole thing and so to be able to humble yourself and recognize okay like I can give you this this and this and this and it's amazing but you still need this this and this yeah. Yeah. Like, let's go. Let's get it all. And if that's being reciprocated back to you. <sighs> yes. Yeah, that is the goal. The yeah. world is uh, kind of your oyster at that point. Yeah, I love that. Um, let's get something really annoying out of the way. Smaller than yours. <laughs> they are small. Smaller than yours. <laughs> Everyone asks. Whereas it, it was actually so annoying because I was so excited to talk to you, mm. but then everyone just got lost on like small hands. What? And I'm just it's like, hmm. just a dumb name. And, and in hindsight, if I thought this illustrious career was going to be mine, I probably would have picked something cooler. But because it sounds yeah. like you just filled out a form. I, I I literally just couldn't think of anything, and I was stressed out because it was the first time ever doing a porn, and really all I was like. I hope I get my dick hard, you know, like with all these people, yeah. all these lights. And so I was doing the paperwork fast and I was frazzled and I hadn't even thought of a stage name. And it was just something sometimes Joanna would like, like kind of like, oh, look at your little hands. And I'm like, <laughs> small hands, like, like a, like an old, like, like a fifties, like mafia guy. But the one who's like terrible, like the mobster who's like always blowing the jobs, like fucking things up. Like, oh, there's small hands again, <laughs> fucking ruining it for everyone. <laughs> so. Okay. But something to set the bar real low and then pleasantly surprise <laughs> yeah, uh, you know. Well, yeah, yeah, I like that actually. It definitely is memorable, so that works for you. Better or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I know Joanna got you into the industry mm -hmm. and it was kind of like a very organic shift, it sounds like. And the last that I understood, you guys were considering yourselves monogamous. Mm -hmm. And whether or not that still stands, which I'd love to hear if it does or not, I'm also so curious if there's like another term that's required because people that are in sex work, it's like, you know, does monogamy encompass what's going on as a term? Because you could, what does that mean? The two of you in your intimate mm -hmm. relationship are just each other, but then your body is also going to work and engaging in the same sort of behavior. Personally, I think people overall get way too bogged down in these terms mm -hmm. and these because and you can also define a lot of these terms differently depending on who who you ask i think the only thing that should matters is if you are in a relationship with another human whatever agreement whatever boundaries are set between you guys that's what you are and that can be you know put whatever name on it you want to some people me and john are not monogamous at all to some of our friends we're we're prudes <laughs> you know um and, and I just think that if people spent less time getting hung up on the these terms and just respecting whoever is opposite them, mm -hmm. you know, in life, um, just say whatever you want. And so for us, um, 
an element of monogamy, for example, is we don't like date other people in real life. You know, we don't have other uh, partners, boyfriends or girlfriends. Um, and 90% of the time we don't have off camera sex with anyone but us, unless it's like a threesome. Um, sometimes Joanna will have little girls nights, you know, but I think that's cute. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, um, and then the rules for on camera are everything goes like if there's a camera on and you're having fun and it's consensual and we're good, everything oh, goes. Okay. That's so, interesting. so that's no limitations whatsoever. No, I mean the, the camera's rolling, so it's all going to be captured. So, I mean, uh, you know, if you're going to do something you're embarrassed about, we can see it. <laughs> I got nothing to hide, you know, um, but that kind of for us is, is just how we've defined our relationship and what works for us and our, uh, boundaries. Um, yeah. and is that monogamous? I don't know. I don't really care. I, that's, this is the way we love and respect each other while also having every adventure and, and experiencing every cool corner of the world we want to explore you know and that's beautiful i feel very similarly i'm not i don't feel at all like a polyamorous person mm. i wouldn't want to date multiple people at the same time it sounds exhausting it's, to be honest for me I, I'm like, I, have I don't prayer, have the like, the mental bandwidth to, to, to join us a lot <laughs> there you go i completely agree but i like the concept of open i think i would like to ultimately have a partner that is like my ride or die, my foundation, mm -hmm. we can jump off of that whenever we want. And you're open as in like, we get a job in Paris, one of mm -hmm. us, and we're open to moving or we're open to having mm -hmm. a kid or we're open to having sex with someone else. Like just a general openness and like respect all the things that you're describing. If, if the core is, I want happiness for you and they're saying it back mm -hmm. and there's respect, then, then you can, you can, you can create uh, just about any cool scenario that you you desire. I'm getting a little choked up about this. Are you crying? Oh my gosh, I love that. Why is that making you emotional? Well, I'm a cancer, so I cry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's just uh, hmm. damn. Now you put it out. <laughs> um, mm. It's something that uh, I. If I could like preach anything, it would be this. And I just wish uh, people could understand that this is a, this is the way. This is the. Mm. It's not conquering. It's not um, a man versus woman. It's not anyone. This is how you do equality to me, in my opinion. Um, and I'm, I, I have proof that it works. So if I can like help in any way people, I think that's what I would like to uh, be known for a little bit. Um, it's like, what's in my heart? Sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. It's really beautiful. Um, and I'm just emotional in general. That's why I'm such a good actor. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, Go on. <laughs> um, I love, now I'm even more of a fan than ever. You got me. That's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's an honor to be able to like put it out there, you know? Yeah, thank you. This is a beautiful shifting moment into wanting to talk about embodiment. Mm -hmm. This is a term that I really love because it's new to me. Like when I was deep in evangelicalism, they were always asking me to separate my body like your flesh is evil and just ah, okay. your spirit is This is of the world and this is mm -hmm. what really matters. Yeah. Exactly. And I eventually learned that the word Satan actually means, like when literally translated, is the divider. And then it like hit me like a ton of bricks because it was like, oh, whenever you're divided, whenever your femininity or like what's known as femininity, your ability to cry and emote, mm -hmm. if you are stifling that and not allowing it just because you're a man, that is by definition, satanic, because you're separating pieces of yourself out. That's and kind of, that's she, kind of cool. <laughs> that's yeah, a cool term. <laughs> so when you say, like, when someone is accusing you of, like, being less of a man or something, it's like, Who's that's doing satanic. that? Who's accusing me of that? Of uh, me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very lucky uh, uh, in that aspect because, first of all, I've never been a very 
traditionally like manly uh, alpha male. I, I wasn't as a child, just it's not part of me. But I also learned that once you, once I started getting successful in porn, I, I kind of felt, oh, I can kind of show a little bit more of like the real me now that no one can say anything. Like, who's gonna tell me I'm not a fucking man? Like, come on, like, are you insane? Like, yeah. so it gave me such a, a cool confidence where, yeah, I fucking cry. Yeah, this is the way I think, like, whatever. I don't even care about being a man. I just wanna be a good person. Yeah. Like, who gives a shit about masculinity? Like, I, I'm successful, I'm happy. Like, I don't, I don't subscribe to it and I don't care. If, if, if this is the shell I was born in, cool. Like, but I, I could give two shits about like traditional masculinity because I just want to have a good life and be happy. And, and I think this is the way to do it. Yeah, yeah. You, because you are such um, like an intuitive, emotional person. And I, I feel like I could see that in you and Owen Gray, who you often work with in your videos. Shout out to Owen Gray, one of my buddies. Um, but so I was like, ex I was already struck by what you two were doing together because I love an MMF situation. And also, don't we all, <laughs> <laughs> I wish everybody loved it. That would be my ideal world, but <laughs> Fair. That has goals, been. goals, something yeah. to aspire to. Yes. Men, don't worry about your masculinity. Don't worry about ownership. It's I just... think it's more masculine. To, oh, to no. if okay, you want, so if we want to go down that road, I would love to go down that road. So for anyone who doesn't know, MMF, there's all these like acronyms in porn. There's all these categories. MMF is two men, one woman. Mm -hmm. So yeah, why is it more masculine? Or just the concept of another man looking at me saying, "Because you're doing that, like you're less of a man." I'm like, really? I don't see you. You step up, dude. Like I. I, what are you if anything that's two men that's more masculinity in one room like do math you know <laughs> um, but again since I don't really care about those concepts I just think it's first visually beautiful like as an art piece to see that that pairing yeah. um, it's also for any men out there who have never together like pleased or attempted to please a woman with another man, it's pretty awesome. And you will get faces that you've never seen before. You will hear sounds that weren't there when you were just doing it alone. And, and there's a, it, again, with, it's, it's like a, it's really a lot like a dance too, though, because it's really dependent on the chemistry and the rhythm of all three. Three's an odd number. So if you're not all in sync, then it, then it doesn't always, it's not always so magical, but when it's working right, you get to, it's elevated. You're, you're, you're not just like having sex on a Friday night anymore. This is like, there's three of us now and we're, there's a lot happening at once and, and people are all, everyone's, you know, in theory getting pleasured and, and pleasing each other. And all of a sudden you get to do this crazy, awesome, elevated thing and get to share this moment. So if someone wants to think that uh, a threesome with two guys is like not manly or it's, or what or that's to me that's just a man who isn't secure enough in himself and it doesn't mean you have to be into that but you shouldn't you know like idea. if anything come on buddy like <laughs> talk to me after you've done one you know <laughs> yeah. I mean I also am so drawn to watching it because it is beautiful and I think the woman looks so beautiful and powerful yeah which is the opposite narrative that's why I never ever liked porn like if you caught I think I did a porn video like three years ago or okay something, talking about porn okay and um it was very I don't want to say closed-minded but I just hadn't discovered porn that resonated with me I hadn't discovered anything where it looked like the women were in genuine pleasure mm -hmm. I, as a woman, would see them grabbing an angle where his dick is like going in a way that's not even, I'm just like, that doesn't even feel good. I know it. Or the girls look in pain or, you know. A lot of it though, you know, like, like Hollywood, like anything, there's, it's a, it's a production, you know, it's not yeah. a, it's an, a, it's not supposed to be completely real. Um, that's intentional. And also porn, it, it, that's like saying like, I, I, I watched, I listened to some music and I couldn't tell if the singer was 
really meaning it or not. <laughs> porn is enormous. So first of all, unfortunately, I, I'm sorry that you watched whatever whatever you found, because because there's always been, to some degree, porn that that and you know my wife can vouch for this, being in the industry for 15 years, where uh, there's lots of of real orgasms and there's lots of uh, reality uh, to the to the pleasure um, wow. and, and sorry oh yeah yeah I'm just like raised on the stigma of well that's the, the stigma darkness like it's mm-hmm. all dark and dreary no one wants to be there the guys want to be there the girls never want to be there I think and I this is like where this was before my time but I think maybe back in a certain era of it it, it was probably close closer to that mm-hmm. um, but in and I can only speak from my experiences um, I haven't really experienced any of that in my past seven or eight years um, as a performer. Obviously, this is you know, like any work industry. You're you're going to meet people who they find out it's not for them. They come and go. Like any work industry, there's some people who may have a drug problem. There's plenty of people who don't. There's a fitness person. There's a genius over here. There's a ballerina. Like it's any work environment. You you get a myriad of people and a cast of characters, and it's no different than any other. Uh, uh, entertainment or, or work uh, industry. So I think the stigma used to be that it's all this thing. Yes. And now the reality is, is porn, like music, is, is a trillion things. It's a million different talents who look different, who have a different style. It's a lot of different companies. It's different types of sex acts. Um, so within that giant umbrella, of course, there's going to be some very shitty porn or some unethical porn yeah, or some absolutely. you know like like and and again I can't even speak to that personally because I've been fortunate enough to only kind of work for the the bigger companies um but I imagine that yeah there's probably some of that so depending on what you're looking at or what you're watching will maybe paint your your perspective on it um and it's hard because it is so vast it's really tough in a quick like, you know, a couple of Pornhub searches to really get the scope of like how much uh, variety there is and the different levels of it. Yeah. Can you tell me why I love Deep Lush so much? Is there something different happening on set or some different intentionality behind it? Um, Deep Lush, meaning me and Owen, well, <laughs> mostly. You are my favorites, yes. But like, I think that there's something. Deep Lush, I'm pretty sure, is his it. site. I think I was going to yeah. ask you, I couldn't figure that out. Um, well, Everything on there, if me and Owen aren't in it, I'm pretty sure he still directs and shoots. So it has a cohesive look. Um, but those, I love those days on set because everything is geared towards one thing and one thing only, and that is having a good sexual experience. There's no script. There's no dumb outfits. There's no yeah. like. There's no fucking on a cement counter, you know. <laughs> Which you know it's cool. I'm I'm always game, but uh, so everyone is actually meant to be genuinely feeling good. That's the priority versus the e- the capturing of the. Animal. Well, the, the the capturing is there. I mean, even like in this interview, like it it'll get captured. You know, like it. it what's more important is the chemistry, the the feeling of like f- comfortability with everyone, and then also everyone being like horny and w- wanting to fuck and wanting to be there. Yeah. Um, so Owen is really good with casting, um, and uh, the environment is just so chill that it's like it doesn't honestly even feel like work. Not not that ninety percent of the time this doesn't feel like work, <laughs> but Owen's the days with Deep Blush really don't feel like work. It feels like I'm getting together with one of my best friends, mm-hmm. and I'm either seeing a friend again if it's a girl I've you know over the years worked with, or I'm getting to meet a new friend. And we're gonna have this awesome time. And when I leave, I either now have a, a cool new friend, and I just had some great sex with her, or I got to have sex again with someone I really like in the industry. And like we all are usually done by like three p.m. <laughs> and it's great. I get to scoot out before traffic in L.A. <laughs> How did you and Owen meet? Uh, we met uh, filming uh, gangbangs up at Kink.com in San Francisco at the Armory. Do you know? Do you know what the Armory is? No. Do you know what kink.com is? Yeah. It's probably the biggest site for like SM and, and BDSM and a lot of the the darker stuff. Um, they used to have a giant uh, like World War One era building in San Francisco, and they had 
enormous movie, like sets, like the like crazy dungeons and like I did a gangbang with Mother Mary upside down on a cross once and yeah, on a wow. pentagram stage, like the size of a freaking basketball court. It was crazy. Um, so I met Owen because not a lot of guys can do gangbangs. It's kind of a specific thing. Even most guys in porn can't really, it's just not. Like it's physically uh, It's 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 difficult for most guys to keep and maintain a steady erection when there's one girl and five guys and you might only have you might only have 30 seconds of sex every you know like you, there's a lot of just standing around and, and and also some guys aren't turned on but you, you gotta it's just not for everyone mm -hmm. so point being the gangbang guys kind of all see each other a lot we're, we're a lot of the same same dudes so i started becoming friends with owen up in san francisco because we were just always in the same gangbangs and sometimes we would even stay the night up there if there was a couple of them back to back and so and the the armory had um hotel like old like 1920s pro like with a key yeah. and the bathroom was communal like a locker room so we all had to like shower together like we're in school yeah that's Adorable. It was cute. It was cute. So I, I became friends with not only Owen, but a lot of the male talent at the time um, doing those because you just see the same guys over and over again. Gotcha. And you two obviously have a real chemistry as well. We, we do. We do. And, and it's, I always say it's like we're a good yin and yang because we don't, in my opinion, we're, we're definitely not the same. And we, we approach things differently, but I think the place it comes from like in our heart is the same. Not to sound kind of corny, but like Cause he's actually a little, he's a, he's very soft spoken. He, he's not, I'm, I'm the one who's like, ha ha, you know, and Owen is more like the strong, silent, like the rock. And I'm the one who's just bouncing all over the walls, like a little puppy dog, happy to be there. <laughs> but the combo is, is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> People seem to like it. Yeah. It's a perfect combo. And the moment that is iconic that I really like stood out to me, mm -hmm. um, you are with your friend, Kristen. Yeah. And there was just a moment that's so adorable where you're both having sex with her and then you mm -hmm. move your leg and your knee like, pops <laughs> her like this and you hear her teeth like, <laughs> yeah. and you with so much genuine compassion grab her face and are like <gasps> and you just see you be like oh my god are you okay and she looks at you and is like i'm okay you guys make out for a second you pull back again to be like are you really okay and then she mm. goes i'm okay and then you like put your dick back in her mouth yeah that and sounds <laughs> sounds like me sounds like me <laughs> and i was so astonished by it and then i read all of the comments and 100% of 100 comments are like, that moment was amazing. I love these guys. Like, they treat <laughs> women well. And I think that, I think like the misconception that I have been given and mm -hmm. fed about porn being dreary and everything really does, it doesn't come from nowhere. Like, a lot of the content Absolutely. is meant to look like mm -hmm. exploitative and hateful sometimes, mm -hmm. violent sometimes, genuinely. Like, mm -hmm. not seeing woman in pleasure is a huge mm -hmm. theme. So I think it was just really beautiful to see that and to see all of these women truly orgasming and being like, these men actually care about this reciprocal experience. And that's what I want to see. I th if I could just tack on a little something Please to teach that. teach me everything. I, 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 I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, but I think everyone needs to be reminded that you can film very rough, very seemingly degrading things i some of my my fans favorite scenes are some of those very gnarly dungeon you know i've waterboarded girls i've done but but again the thing is yeah that's only degrading if the performer in it feels degraded or didn't want to be there or doesn't want to do it and specifically for those kinds of scenes uh if anything it's almost always uh I, I need to go, like the, the girl is asking me like, no, you can, like, let's get crazier. Let's go, like, get, let's get wilder. Let's get more. And, uh, and I think I'm still being just as loving and respectful as I am in a, a deep lush scene because what I'm ultimately here for is to do what she wants. Mm. And so if she wants to be degraded, and there are pl plenty of uh, females who, who will raise their hand and say, that is what gets me off. That is what, like, please, you know, like, that's that's the type of sex I want. And then there are plenty who don't want that at all. And 
you know, part of my job is to know who's who and, and to, or if it's someone new, I have to suss out like, okay, what, what are we doing today? Because ultimately, again, my goal is not to have any type of sex one way or another. It's to have the type that my, my partner opposite me wants to have. Um, and I think the variety is really fun. I, I love getting super disgusting, you know, with, <laughs> with people who want to, yeah. but I also love very romantic, slow, kissy, you know, just passionate sex as well. And I, I love the variety of it. And I love that. I like something right is smack in the middle of those two. Scenes. Yeah. I mean, I think too, you know, porn is a place for people to, in a closed course, you know, in a safe environment consensually get out their wildest shit you know like and then for for other people who might want to watch that and again there's always lines and there's degrees and um you know i have things i won't do um on camera even though i'll do a lot you know um and it's i don't think it's up to me to to, to judge it as long as it was made in a way that was ethical and consensual um i think that's 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 as good as you can you know hope for um and now if stylistically something isn't for you you just don't watch it yeah totally um i think that i know you're asked a lot uh like how can i be good at sex especially from men sometimes yeah yeah but i think that probably like a better question is um like really how to be good at sex because I interviewed this amazing sex worker in Australia named Tilly Lawless. Mm -hmm. And she was just, she described it. She said, sometimes suck fucking clients is like fucking a black hole. And they just don't get in a rhythm with her. And she just was describing sex as this communicative experience. Mm -hmm. And you're reading each other's bodies in each mm -hmm. moment. And she was also saying you can consent to having sex, you can consent to all different acts, but then the ability to read someone's body, like if they tense up or if you hit them at an angle and you can tell it hurts them, you don't push into that further. You like read their body and dance with them. I mean, consent isn't black and white, you know, yeah. it's, it's has degrees. And also there's um, like sometimes in porn, there's a phrase where I, I'll say, you know, I want to bend you, but I don't want to break you. Meaning, do you want to explore the edges of your boundaries? Because that's exciting sometimes. But you, but and we will. But as we both know that we're not gonna go to a dark place, like um, you know, you, you, like in reality. Um, so, like a lot of times, if I'm doing a rough sex scene uh, and something is like physically happens, that's painful. We all have little codes. I'll get the like, and you, the camera, will, you'll, the viewer will never even see it because we know what to do. And I get a little, oh, okay, yeah, let me switch over into something else. And 90% of the time, we don't even have to cut. It's just a thing because, again, something that maybe is okay in the moment here might not be okay in the moment here, or maybe it reads different, or maybe it, it impacts different. So um, part of consent is that it's always kind of like running. Yeah. Or what? I don't know how if that's the right way to do it, but yeah, totally and true. and especially if if someone's entrusting you to their body mm. and their like sexuality, like it's probably a good idea to be pretty uh, you know, checking in. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, uh, I think the easiest way for people to be good at sex, both of all genders, is to humble yourself and take your own ego out of it and try to try with all your might to please the other person in whatever way that is, you know, comfortable for you, but also like, you know, set, what do they want? What, what gets them off? You take your, it's not about you. Being good at sex is being able to realize that it has nothing to do with, with, with me. It's me wanting to do things for you. But if both people are doing that equally, wow, like, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. so that's the really, that's the, the secret to good sex is, is taking your own ego out of it and wanting to please the other person with everything you have inside of you. Wonderful. Yes. With that, let's pivot to music. You ready? Let's go. <laughs> Probably won't cry as much in the music section. Or maybe I will. Who knows? Well, maybe you cry <laughs> I write all sad songs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's true. So your band, which is essentially you, me. yeah, is Empty Streets. Mm -hmm. You have a new album, and then you also have a new album coming out of remixes. Mm -hmm. Give us yeah. the details. Yeah, so Empty Streets is, um, it's me. I write all the songs, I sing everything, I play everything. 
Um, it's kind of like a Depeche Mode, like 80s synth kind of pop project. Um, and I've put out a couple records. Um, the most recent one is called Age of Regret, and uh, it's out now on Spotify and Apple and all the, all the platforms. Um, and I signed to Cleopatra Records in Hollywood uh, last year. So um, the next thing that's coming out is uh, an EP of remixes um, that's going to drop on the 28th of February. Okay, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. So I liked that you were saying that you have always been a musician and you always mm -hmm. wanted to like dive back in, but the pandemic mm -hmm. actually finally gave you the ability, time, yeah. energy to actually pour into it. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact that so many of my friends, myself included, have had major reckonings mm -hmm. through the pandemic because it was a lot of alone time, a lot of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, like, were these emotions bubbling in you before? Because this album, you said, is a lot about betrayal. Not sexual betrayal, but betrayal of, like, the things you were basically taught in church when you were younger mm. and taught about God and taught about yourself and then realizing those veils fell and wasn't true. I mean, I, I'm i kind of like a, a broken record, I guess, musically. Like, that's kind of the only songs I ever write. And it's it's my own way to, like reckon with my upbringing um it's kind of been my therapy where my just maddening frustration and just cruel reality you know kicking me in the face uh i gotta put that somewhere some people you know have different outlets so for me i writing songs is basically my form of like maintaining my mental health <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but unfortunately or fortunately, depending on what kind of songs you like, most of my shit's pretty bleak and pretty <laughs> down. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, m most of, most of my, my lyrics, especially on this record are just a total reckoning and fury with, with the hypocrisy and the betrayal of, of the, the, the classic church and the sort of classic Western Christian sort of structure of everything of the household of gender of of socially things um i just it, it was something that i kind of um i had to put my anger somewhere mm. um and and i'm you know i'm furious on this album <laughs> and, and i'm hurt too that's the other thing because growing up you know i was a good kid i didn't do drugs i didn't drink I was a virgin for till college, you know, like uh, I, I got straight A's like I, and and you, what I got in return is my fucking dad disowning me like you, that you just like what, you know, <laughs> and and uh, you know, I don't even know money. I've never owed them money, nothing. <laughs> um, and so I had I had I had I have so much feeling from that. I have to put it somewhere. And so I just choose music as a place to you know like like let it out um and so yeah that's that's mm. that's my kind of process when i write songs yeah i think that's such a healthy catharsis that's what art is for it's also very vulnerable i imagine uh, hey when your butt crack and balls have been filmed in 4k <laughs> for the world vulnerability is is whatever you know but if any, it's a different kind of emotional it vulnerability. is it's different. but i i've learned more and more in this life to go like don't run away from that go into that lean into it run to that vulnerability like put it out there the worst that can happen is someone like makes fun of you who cares yeah. like whatever you know yeah. <laughs> and and but what you're gonna do is if you're true to it and you're authentic that people will respond not everyone but the right people there will be people who are like wow like that speaks to me and that hits me in a certain way and like i don't need everyone to say that I just wanted some people to say it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to pour salt in the wound by like bringing it up, mm. but it's it's just relevant because I have so many members of my beautiful people who have been disowned by family, mm. especially if they are any gender that they weren't as like right. described at birth, if they are LGBTQ. I had it easy. I'm a cis straight male. Like <laughs> I, I had, you know, and I'm still fucked up over it. So. Yeah. I, you know, my heart goes out to everyone who's ever been betrayed by the church or this system, this lie of, of how the world, you know, we've all been told this is how it has to be. Yeah. And it's not true. Why did, why did he have to cut it off? Like, why? My dad? Yeah. 
Uh, well, he actually disowned me before I even did porn at all, just for dating Joanna. Oh. So I got a phone call uh, one day, and it was like, I got a question to ask you. And I was like, oh, I already know this. Mm -hmm. And we had, I wanted them to give her a chance when we started dating. So at the beginning, uh, I don't like lying to my parents, but I just did it. I thought it was the right thing to do. I told them she was a music journalist. She, they don't know, and they're so in the dark ages about everything. Like, I don't even think my dad has an email address. So I was like, okay, this will buy us some time. And it sucked because they really loved her and they got to know her a little bit and they, wow. they, they liked her and they enjoyed being around her. And then I, who knows how he found out. I got the call one day. I got the, oh, I can't believe this. You're going to hell, blah, blah, blah. He's screaming at me, a click. And I'm so sorry. Yeah, me too. That's awful. I mean, we didn't, not to sound morbid, but. I, we, we never really had a relationship at all to begin with. So this was, if anything, just like, like, all right, it's been a long time coming. Like, you've been looking for something. Now you got it. Okay. You know, it hurt me more because I didn't get to see my mom for years. Um, wow. That was tough. Um, you know, and I got excommunicated from all of the family events and my grandma's funeral. I was told I wasn't allowed to come to. And um, so that was pretty tough. And for actually up until this past year me and my mom have been pretty estranged too but but in the last year we've actually been making some some inroads and and she uh yeah we've, we've visited each other a couple of times so little 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 steps you know that's good well remember what i told you about satanic and that definition like what your dad has done is satanic yeah sorry to call you out sir but yeah. like that division that separation family is dividing yeah, over it, Something as pure as like you just cried because of how much you love her, like, and saying that's wrong is wrong. Well, when you're more hung up on some text in an old ass book that's been fucking translated a hundred times and rewritten to everyone's different agenda, if you're hung up on that more than your own family, like, I don't know what I can say. You know, I, like, there's no more, there's, there's no discussion, I guess. Like, okay, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, hope it's real. Ooh, hope, I well, hope. I hope that's you know, not real. That is not a god that I would want to worship. worship no, or anything. It, it's one of those things though where I always, I, I would, I, I think it would be cool for it to be real. Like I like the idea of God and like a reason and like a plan. I like I think that's to me infinitely cooler than just thinking this is all a fucking whack accident <laughs> explosion big bang. Yeah. But I think both are equally ridiculous. To, to believe, so I think either <laughs> could be possible. I just think it would be cooler if this was all like someone's design and there was sort of a thing, like, I don't even know if God's the right word or, or you know, um, if there was, if this was orchestrated and there was like a, a reason, I think that would be way cooler. And also I think that if that was real, I'd probably be like on their side. I think, I hope, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> I still use the label Christian and it does resonate with me, mm. but it's like, I think both things can be true. Mm. That God is mm. with a lowercase g. It's based in fear, hate, division, mm. all of that. Then there's uppercase g, love, community, reciprocity, equality. Like and the spirit of all of those things is 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 universal. I mean, that that's good for anyone. If you're an atheist, a Buddhist, a mm -hmm. Christian, like all of those sort of like tenets are, are pure and good. So I think those are the things that if everyone kind of like, if God is that, then, then that's, that's okay. It's, it's when God is this like man, you know, in a painting mm -hmm. or, you know, this, this condemning thing that literally is like, like everything changes in the world. The, the way we eat food is not the way that it was in biblical <laughs> times. The clothes we wear, the, the way we get around with transportation. We're not riding fucking horses anymore, or, you know, unless it, you're in certain parts of <laughs> rural America. But, you know, how is religion the only thing that's allowed to stay the same? Mm -hmm. How is that the only thing in our whole fucking society that, like, we have to keep pointing at this old ass mindset? And it's, it's just stupid. Like, Literally everything else in the world progresses. Everything. Even trees don't say the same. Like everything has a, a fluid, a motion, a season. And as it goes along, it gets refined or, or 
if, if it sucks, it, it burns out, you know, evolution. Mm -hmm. How is religion like exempt from like, like getting into the fucking times? And that's why I, I don't subscribe to really any of it. Because 90% of it, to my knowledge, is the top is a man. It's written by men. That alone is like a red flag. And then when it, something's been translated over years in different languages, that's another way for it to get lost. Like it's, there's just so much w ways for this to be like such a mess <laughs> to me that I'm just like, if you find peace in it, cool. But it's real hard for me to take it very seriously. I mean, you're someone that I see, and I think like Christ consciousness. It's like that that energy. It's goodness. It's but I think concepts of spirituality and faith and and belief are, are very good things to possess, and mm -hmm. and I don't think that those are scary terms at all. It's just like the God of our fathers is what I always say. Like the God of my fucking dad. That's no God I want to fucking deal with mm -hmm. or know or believe in or anything. But I like the. The loose concept of what he tried, you know, I, I I like the idea, you know, and I don't think I'll really know till till I'm, you know. <laughs> and the Scott's aesthetic is beautiful. You and John are about to move into a church. Yes, praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> it all comes I'm gonna get me a back. I'm gonna get me a Hammond organ and Sunday service. Come on in, <laughs> come on in, beautiful. yeah. <laughs> Well, this has been a beautiful conversation. Thank you for I having me. I adore you. Now I'm even more of a fan. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks for coming and hanging out with me and letting me... I don't get to talk about this kind of stuff too often. So. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, just to leave it on an up note, any advice for... No, <laughs> I feel like you give advice for the world? on so many things. Um, any final note that's lingering in your mind? Just, just worry about being a good person and less about all of these things that man has constructed and told you because most of that shit is was created out of thin air and also can be sort of left left in the dust just focus on your partner and the agreement the relationship you have and being a decent human being amen thank you all for watching love you so much god bless